Hey guys, a little bit of a quick video before Gone and Back Again comes out. It's not going to come out in the next couple of days or maybe in the next couple of weeks. It's hard to tell. Um, the script's all finished. We're just needing to get the recording done and piece everything together. But in the meantime, I'm going to throw a little video your way to keep you all entertained. We're going to talk about the, the 11 Live and Reloaded episodes that never were. Well, not the 11, but the most interesting 11, because we had about 60 ideas for Live and Reloaded episodes, but not all of them could see the light of day, but these are the most interesting ones that we had to cut. Whether it be because we only have a certain amount of episodes left, whether it be certain flaws in the episode, or whatever it may be. Why 11 of them? Well, that's because those are the most interesting ones. All the other ones basically have the same reason, which I'll tackle later on. You'll kind of see that it's going to ha have one of, or more of these in there, and I'm not going to share them all. Probably you'll just have to leave it up to your imagination. So let's get on with number 11. In no particular order, though, although the last three are probably the most interesting. Let's just start off with the 11th one that never came to be. Mission Improbable, the story of Hudson Taylor. Yeah, they did George Mueller, so we decided, hey, let's try Hudson Taylor. You know, the missionary went to China and all that, or, I don't remember if it was China. It's been so long since I did research on Hudson Taylor because we decided not to do this episode because, well, we weren't feeling that it could really capture the VeggieTales style as that is why we make Live Reloaded to capture said style. We didn't think it could be done and also, while it is good to teach kids about missionaries, the subject material itself wasn't very exciting nor was it very kid-ish, I guess. Because I know we have a lot of older fans, but, well, VeggieTales was primarily made for kids, although it caters to everybody, but it was it's kids were its main focus. The stories, although had a lot of action, there were a lot of dry parts, and there were also a lot of parts that kids wouldn't quite get, even if we simplified it. And we weren't going to kind of do something like Rack Shack and Benny or Flipper Lou or anything. We were just going to tell the story straight, because, well, Hudson Taylor's probably one of the most famous missionaries in the Christian faith. However... Like I said, we just weren't feeling it, and it kept getting pushed back and back and back, and then finally, kaput. Although it was a good idea, and I'm kind of sad to see it go, I know that if we had more time, we might have tried a little bit more, but as it stands, Mission Improbable is probably one that's not going to see the light of day. And then 10, this is a bit of a weird one. This is one of the weirdest, not the weirdest, you'll know what that is, but... One of the weirder ones. So, around the time of Eddie Woodley, uh, yeah, around that time, I was tossing around a couple more ideas, which the next became Egomaniac. And then I came up with one idea that I decided to put away. But then around the time of Samson, that's where we got our big story boom, and we came up with that list of about 60. With that, I brought that one idea back, and then after a short while, canned it, and then brought it back. And then around the time of, say, I want to say Job, that's when we canned it for good. The story? Siskel and Ebert, you know, the film critics. Because they're so full of pop culture and had a lot of stuff with movies and pop culture, which, of course, Big Idea loves. We thought it would be fun to kind of tell their story in an Ed Wood light. Uh, a couple problems there. For one, Ebert was definitely not a Christian. Uh, Siskel was Jewish, which... Well, to be fair, the people in the Bible weren't Christians, they were Jewish, although until, you know, Jesus died on the cross, but that, that's, you know what I mean. Uh, and then two, there's no real lesson from it. We were going to try to tell, like I said, the way Eddie Woodley did, just kind of making it hammy and overblown instead of Siskel dying, he just leaves. But we couldn't find a lesson from it, and it just seemed a little weird to base an episode off of. We love Siskel and Ebert, we really do. And we wanted to do some sort of tribute, but this just wasn't the way. If you were wondering, Paul Great was going to be Ebert, Skylin 3 was going to be Siskel, and Larry was going to be uh, Richard Roper, who came in later. But, like I said, it just didn't work. And also, for the very little, tiny bit, I wrote a little scene to see if it would work, and it was so hokey, and uh, it just did not work, not at all. So, the untitled Siskel and Ebert episode, yeah, not gonna happen. These next two had the same reason, so I'm gonna kind of list these in the same one. First, have you ever heard of Max Locato? He's a very famous Christian author. 
He's probably most well known for his children's works. For example, the Wemex. For those who don't know what the Wemex are, it's a story of these tiny wooden people who live in a little village called Wemex Town, specifically revolving around the t events of two of them, Punchinello and Lucy. I think that was her name. No, uh, Lucia. That's what it was. Lucia. I knew Lucy wasn't right. Uh, it revolves around their adventures and kind of learning about how to go through life and getting closer with their creator, Eli, who is a metaphor for Jesus. We were going to do one of the most famous stories, if o only I had a green nose, revolving around Larry or Junior, we couldn't decide, as Punchinello, and then the events of, you know, getting the green nose and all that, with a lesson in not partaking in fads, because, although that seems like a little weird lesson, it actually is really important, because people get so absorbed in that, they keep their, they take their eyes off of what's really important, although... It could be a little bit of a priorities lesson. We were going to tackle it a lot different. The next one was the Chronicles of Vegia, specifically parodying the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Two, these two had the same problem. They're already Christian. Part of what Veggie Tales is doing is taking non-Christian stuff and adding it to it. And while a nice adaptation of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or if only it had a green nose, would have been good. Here's the problem. They already have adaptations that do well. I have just recently seen The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and I really liked it, and it was a very good representation of the book. Uh, Punchinello, or the Wemmick stories, I should say, they have these animated adaptations, which, although they're not nearly as good as the books were, though, you know, I don't really read the books myself, because I'm, you know, way too old for that, but I do remember them, and I think we still have them in, like, a keepsake box, but... Anyways, I'm very familiar with the books, and I remember seeing some of those animated specials that they had based off of them. They represented the books well. I don't think they cut anything out. Of course, they had to lengthen it a bit. It taught the lesson well. It kept the spirit of the book, although not as enjoyable. And a little bit kind of kiddicized, I guess. It had a serviceable thing. The problem is, with these two things, specifically the Wemex, we couldn't put the VeggieTales spin on it. This is the acid test. Things like Gary Platter... Cucurama or Slackerville, those passed the test, albeit with Slackerville, a narrow margin, to put the interesting VeggieTales spin on it. These two had nothing. Because they were already Christian, that was already a downside. But I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Next is The Hunched Man of Notre Dame. We've teased this one before, and this is the only one you guys are actually aware of. Because we had a vote on this one, and it got last place every time. Both times, I should say. It was the Hunchback of Notre Dame, but, like, it's with football, so it's Notre Dame, because a lot of people mispronounce it that way. Quasimodo is the mascot who is constantly hidden away. Esmeralda is the head cheerleader. Phoebus is the captain. And then F Coach Frollo seeks to kind of dominate over this. We didn't have a lesson, but we really liked the story. But the problem is, have you read the story? That is not okay for you. I'm surprised Disney was able to do it so well. Granted, they'd take, of course, those typical Disney liberties and add in the gargoyles and whatnot. But there's no way we could do this with uh, VeggieTales. Whether it be the concept being kind of inflexible, a lesson that's really hard to come by, or just the way too dark nature. I mean, you saw in the silliness, right? That, that was not good. We want to stray away from that kind of stuff. So this one was on the back burner for a long time, but as of like only a couple weeks ago, we decided that we weren't going to pursue this one. Very simple, very straightforward, but we just can't do it. We wanted to, but it just doesn't seem right. We try, I think we put the spin on it pretty well, but the problem is it could only really work on paper. If you try to make it too light, you're not doing a serviceable job for the book and you're not making it very similar, you're making it just barely anything. Now, they've done barely anything before, they've done those adaptations. But with something like this, it just doesn't work. Case in point, the Golden Films version. So yeah, Punchman in Notre Dame. So close, yet so far. And here comes another one of those weird ones. Again, not the weirdest, but I'd probably put this at second weirdest, Gravity Falls. That alone should tell you why we did not do it. Now, we weren't, this we, this one wasn't really one we were seriously pursuing. We always kept it in the back of our minds like, hey, wouldn't that be cool to have Junior be Dipper, um, Mad Marv be Grunkle Stan, because they already sound alike, and, you know, uh, Jimmy could be Seuss, Laura could be, we Laura could be, not Wendy, Mabel. 
Gordon could be Gideon. And wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be a lot of fun? Well, yeah, it was, but like this was only when the very beginning of season two come, came out. I think the newest episode was Seuss and the Real Girl at the time. So we were deciding to wait. We were waiting and waiting to see how the story would end. And if it had something we could do with VeggieTales, we would consider it. But uh, then Weird Mageddon came out, and then we knew right away, yeah, this is done. We can't do this. No way. But to be honest, we actually kind of forgot about it. This is, of the list, the second least serious we've actually considered it. Just wait till the number one spot. That's number one for a reason. Although the numbering is mostly arbitrary, like I said. Yeah, Oregon Falls, the mysterious book. Um, it had a... The journal was the Bible, and it was going to have something to do about the Bible. But we liked the lesson about reading the Bible, so we decided to transfer it into another one that we're hoping to get out this summer. Which, you'll have to see. I'm pretty proud of that one, and we're that's definitely a priority one to get out. Still, uh, Oregon Falls, the mysterious book, not going to happen. No way. Next is War and Peaches, based off of War and Peace. This one has a little bit of a backstory. So, Mike Naraki and Phil Vischer, when they were originally creating VeggieTales, they were going to, instead of doing Bible stories, they were just going to do classic literature, hence the Grapes of Wrath segment in God Wants Me to Forgive Them. They were going to do stuff like, well, Madame Blueberry, which is the only other one that ever came out, but they were going to do Bridge Over Pumpkin Pie, War and Peaches, stuff like that. So, Alfonso and I decided, hey, let's try Warm Peaches. I mean, that's one they wanted to do and it never came out. Y yeah, I can see why. For one, War and Peace is about, the book is about the size of the Space Needle. It's huge. And condensing all that into an at most hour show, uh, not gonna happen for one. Two, there's no real flowing narrative with War and Peace. It's more like five, because there's five central stories to that, as far as I know, because I haven't read the thing. But it would have taken me about a year to do so with all the workload I have. And the subject material that's in there that I know of, not for kids. And that's pivotal to the story. So I can't tell you how they were going to do it, but I can tell you one thing. We're not going to do it. Coming up, another really fun one we wanted to do, but just didn't stick. For our two-year anniversary, before we decided to do Gary Platter, we had the Mr. Visher character, and we really wanted to utilize him more. Because this was before Mr. Visher really got to do a lot more stuff. So, because we already had Chuck and the Fantastic Factory planned out, but for our second one, we were going to do Me, Myself, and Bob. Now, what is Me, Myself, and Bob, you are wondering? That is Phil Vischer's autobiography that he wrote about his life, how he grew up, how VeggieTales came to be, all that sort of stuff. We were going to adapt that with him and Nate Rocky playing Phil Vischer and Mike Rocky, respectively. And instead of them forming big ideas, them meeting Bob and Larry and getting the d idea for the show. Now, this one isn't totally off the table. We might actually just do this for a fun little thing. But for as an episode, episode of Live and Reloaded, it's not gonna happen. Although we might do it a little bit just for like, like I said, a fun little project. Like a, one of those Live and Reloaded extra videos we have, like the food specials or veggie shorts or the commentaries. Something like that. As it stands though, if you want to know Phil Vischer's story, I highly suggest reading the book. It's great. It's really funny and it gives a lot of really good insight and a lot of good lessons too. It also really helped me with Veggie Talks, which yes, there will be more of that coming soon. But it also really helped me learn about stuff like what was the deal with 321 Penguins and why the cartoon adventures of Larry Boy turned out the way it did. It's basically your big idea guide to everything you need to know up until the buyout. So I'd recommend reading that. And also, again, it failed the acid test of putting an interesting spin on it. The only thing we could think of was having them meet up, meet up with Bob and Larry instead. Other than that, there's not much you can do with Phil Vicious life. I mean, sorry, dude, your life was awesome. It still is, because he's still alive. But it's not leading to an actual story. Uh, oh, well, though. I guess you can all just imagine what it would be. Now, here come the big three that I mentioned. These big three are the most interesting ones that we've had to can. One of which being one that we were not even really considering seriously, but more on that later. Third, Minnesota Cuke and the Search for the Baptist Coat. Of the ones that were canned, this was the one in production the uh, longest, because this one actually did start production. 
this was probably one of the only ones that actually started legitimate production. Now, the Siskel and Ebert one had a little bit written just to see if it would work, and it didn't. But this one is the only one that actually had, like, act an actual earnest scene. They had the countertop and the opening, and then it was scrapped. So I never given my thoughts on Minnesota Cuke, really, and now it's time I do. They're really good, although the first one is definitely better than the second. You know, first one being Samson's Hairbrush, second being Noah's Umbrella. Just because Noah's Umbrella's songs kind of suck, and it's kind of a repeat of the first one, which is why Baptist Coat wasn't a thing. See, Minnesota Cuke has kind of a formula to it. Not knocking the second one, like I said, the second one's still good, just not as good as the first one. Being one of the few veggie sequels that is actually, like, really good, except for Larry Boy. Eh, that's a topic for another day. Anyways. Minnesota Cuke is basically Minnesota Cuke goes out on an adventure, and then it fails somehow. He comes back to Martin, relays his problem. Then there's some guy there who wants to have Minnesota Cuke go on a mission. So he seeks out to find a friend, usually Julia, who, go, who gives him some sort of information. Then a whole bunch of crazy hijinks ensues involving foreign countries, and then he meets up and then surprise, surprise, to ascending, and then it turns out that the thing he was looking for, being the hairbrush or umbrella, or in this case the Baptist coat, isn't actually what gives them the power, it's what God, it's God that gives them power, and then the villain gets defeated, and then he gets set out for another quest. That is basically the Minnesota Q formula. Now, we like the first two just fine. But we don't want a third one doing the same thing. If we change it out too much, it's... Well, then we're getting into In the House territory. We were going to have it be John the Baptist coat and all, and then how he would be able to, like, purify people and redeem people. But again, it falls too much into the trap. And also, we couldn't incorporate Mr. Nazar into it because he was in uh, Noah's Umbrella. So we couldn't do that. It wouldn't make much sense. And it stinks, though, because he'd be a great villain. And it was going to be kind of more parroting the Temple of Doom, because the first one was more Raiders of the Lost Ark. The second one skipped Temple of Doom, and then went on to Last Crusade. I mean, what do you think we're going to parody? The Crystal Skull? No, uh, no, we're not doing that. Temple, it was going to be kind of more Temple of Doom-ish, but again, just didn't work. Too much repetition, not enough substance. Sorry, Minnesota Cuke, but I guess your Live and Reloaded episode won't ever happen. Here comes the second one, Little Shop of Horrors. This one is one, aside from, I'd say, Minnesota Cuke, this is the one we came furthest along until we hit a couple stopping points. So Little Shop of Horrors is probably one of my favorite musicals. Keep that in mind as we're getting along. But it's a really fun one. It's about a nerdy kid, a nerdy orphan kid specifically, who lives in a flower shop and comes across this demented Venus flytrap, which promises to fulfill his life's desires if he keeps feeding him people. But as he keeps feeding him people, the plant continues to grow and grow and grow. Now, we thought this would be pretty good for a VeggieTales one. I mean, yeah, it's about killing and stuff, and have you seen the Little Shop cartoon? Terrible. But if we put the veggie spin on it, it would work, and it did. So what we had instead was Seymour, who was, you know, the main character. Oh, who was it who played him? I think it, I think it was Larry in this one. Yeah, I think Larry was Seymour. I know Palgrape was Mr. Mushnick. The plant was the plant, but it sounded like Mr. Nazar. Uh, Audrey was Petunia. No, wait, Orin was Mr. Nazar, and then the plant just kind of had a deep voice. Anyways... We had the casting done, so that was a good thing. We had him instead do, instead of feeding the plant people, he would do things that the, pl uh, that the plant would ask him to do, like bad things, like a bad influence type thing. This was before Chuck. So this originally had the bad influence moniker, or the bad influence lesson. And it was going to be about that, and then as that happened, that caused the plant to grow, and then C uh, Seymour would get all his stuff. But d do you see the problem here with this? Uh, Someone doing something that a plant wants, causing the plant to grow and get more powerful. Uh, Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed, anyone? Not only was the Rumor Weed based off of Audrey 2 from Little Shop of Horrors, but yeah, it kind of took the same central premise. Uh-oh. So we decided to pull it back and kind of retool it a bit. See if we could find anything. And then Chuck came out and had the, I think, would have been a better Bad Influence thing than Little Shop of Horrors did, because Chuck is still number one. And so Little Shop of Horrors was left on the sidelines for a while, still trying to find that good lesson. 
It was stuff like discernment, but then the second Gary Platter took that. No Lesson and a pretty similar plot to Rumorweed, as well as a bit more hard, you know, trying to take this ultra campy musical and then turn it into an ultra campy not quite musical. It was all these things, all these roadblocks just kept popping up. And we decided it just wasn't worth it. The story specifically, you know, being too similar to the that episode, it just couldn't work, we think. we It just wouldn't work, and it wouldn't be worth taking up one of our slots and all our time and your time doing it. Now we're on to number one. Jeez, I built this up so much already. Now, now before I say this, do keep in mind, we have very high standards for stories here at Live and Reloaded. We work tirelessly to make sure that we're giving you the best we can give you. That's why Slackerville was so hard, because we wanted to make sure we were giving you good stuff. And sometimes we can push it, like, uh, st for stuff that's not meant for kids. Futurama, for example, we were able to adapt that pretty well. That's probably the fan favorite episode, even though Chuck is our personal favorite. People seem to like Futurama the most. Which, yeah, that can pay off. So, adapting stuff for adults, yeah, that, that can work sometimes if you're very careful. Some stuff, though, is just not meant to be adapted. And like I said, we always look out for our audience. We care about you guys. You help us uh, grow, you help us develop, and hopefully when we get our own actual non vegetal show someday, we'll have been able to learn from all your feedback. We appreciate your support, and we, in return, want to give you the best we can give you. But one idea that we were semi-tossing around, not, not seriously, but... It more like how Slackerville started off when we were just saying, hey, you know what would be cool if we did this and this and this? Although it never really got to that light bulb moment that that did because of what it's based off of. I'm not going to tell you what it is quite yet. I'm just going to relay the story and see if you can pick it up. I, I will tell you, of course, but it's about a guy who just graduates college and comes to this pretty rundown city. In there, he needs to find his purpose in life, come closer to God, and meets a whole bunch of colorful, wacky characters that all have their own problems, including a set of roommates, one a slob, one an uptight, persnickety guy, one who's trying to find their special person in life, another who is just a complete mess slob, and then another who is ultra manipulative in every way. Although my target fan base is our target fan base, sorry, because we're a team. Our target fan base is kids, those who aren't, and those who know musical theater would know, especially because of what I've been up to lately. Uh, well, not lately, the, it just ended. I will make a video about that, but yeah, it's Avenue Q. I'm sorry. Now, like I said, we weren't actually considering Avenue Q. We did get as far as the casting and lesson, finding your meaning in life. Like, well, that's kind of what the original did. And we even had some of the characters, like Mr. Nez was going to be Trekkie Monster, although it was going to be more, instead of the internet is for, and my social life is online, it was going to be that he looks up online and stuff, all these useless facts, kind of like what Mitch Telly was a little bit, in, when he's like, I edit Wikipedia on a daily basis, I know everything. It's basically like that, Trekkie was going to be kind of this guy who blurts out a bunch of false information he finds on the internet and totally buys it hook, line, and sinker. Uh, Nikki and Rod were going to be more of just, instead of fighting over Rod's um, preference quirks, I should say, uh, it, it was going to be more about, you know, the two finding common ground and stuff and, you know, being more friendish. Christmas Eve was not nearly going to be over the top. She was going to be played by Madame Blueberry, and she was more going to make a bunch of analogies people don't understand instead of her language. Jimmy was going to be Brian, Archibald was going to be Rod, Larry was going to be Nikki, Bob was going to be... Was Bob going to be Princeton? I don't, I don't think we ever decided on a Princeton, but I know Petunia was Kate, no, Eden was Kate, and... Uh, Petunia was Lucy, who was, of course, radically different to just someone who gives a bunch of bad advice. And uh, the same note, the bad idea bears were not in it. But if they were, they would be played by the French Peas. Yeah, it seems like we're coming pretty long, right? Got a lot of good story, got a lot of stuff. Um, but have you seen Avenue Q? If you're a kid, I highly recommend you don't. It's a hilarious play 
fault with a lot of thought provoking and heart t- uh, heartfelt moments and also laugh out loud humor but if you're if you're under the age of 17 do not watch it you will be scarred it is a hard r musical for sure and i feel kind of dirty for having been a part of it well we did the pg-13 version but you know what i mean not something for kids no uh, to be fair futurama was but futurama never went as far as avenue q avenue q is sesame street but for adults. And right there, I think you can see what it is. Just look at the song names and you'll see what we mean. But like I said, if you're under the age of 17, do not do it. I don't care if you think that you know all that there is to know about life, do not. Not only will you not get a lot of the pop culture references and a lot of the bodily function jokes, you will be exposed to stuff that should not be exposed to for kids. That is if you watch the regular version. Even the school edition, aka PG-13 version, it'd go over your head. You wouldn't quite get it. So yeah, uh, that alone and that being too similar, we think, to the actual version. Although with work, with work, we could tune it. We could turn it uh, Parkway V, as we call it, instead of Avenue Q. We could turn it into a lighthearted family romp. But because of the stigma from where it came from, we don't feel comfortable pursuing it. We've done Harry Potter, we've done Futurama, we've even done Lazy Town, although that was family friendly. But we cannot bring ourselves to do Avenue Q. It's tempting, but we will not take that bait. So, Parkway V, probably the most interesting, and definitely the most no-no. So, those are 11 the most interesting 11 of that, episodes of VeggieTales Live and Reloaded that have never and most likely will never come to be. If you do see one of these p- things, either the fans have made a very, 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 very good convincing case to reverse these rulings, or we found some way to make them work, which is very unlikely because we have our own other stories to work with. Let us know what you thought of these episodes in the comments, specifically those last three, because we're really interested in seeing what What do you guys thought of these? What do you think about these episodes that won't ever become anything? And we hope that gives you a little bit of insight in the process of how these Live and Reloaded episodes come to be in at least the story development process. It's a lengthy period. It takes about a couple months for each episode. But we hope that you guys really enjoyed this and we'll come back with the next episode pretty darn soon. Alright guys, signing off.